with very insightful comment about um, contemporary, mainly contemporary American politics. But he's just written a book called The Retreat of Western Liberalism in the Trump, it's not in the Trump era, The Retreat of Western Liberalism, uh, which I think is a hugely insightful uh, piece of work, uh, a reflection of wide reading, very strong sense of history, and a very acute observation about the current uh, political situation in the world, not just in America. He's had a very distinguished career, including being speechwriter for Larry Summers when in the, during the Clinton administration, being head of the New Delhi Bureau in, for the FT, worked for The Guardian along the way. Great um, uh, honour also to speak at the, the, the IIEA. Thank you very much for inviting me. You mentioned... Um, um, that I'd been speechwriter to Larry Summers, and I always make um, make the caveat that, that that was when he was Treasury Secretary, not when he was President of Harvard, um, <laughs> which, as you might remember, he lacked a speechwriter. Um, my, my last book was called Time to Start Thinking, America and the Spectre of Decline, and the New York Times very generously gave me a, a quite a prominent review in which they said uh, it should be renamed Time to Start Drinking. Um, from time to start thinking. Um, this was four years ago, five years ago, in fact, now. Um, and the basic, basic analysis of that book was about the middle class hollowing out. And I believe we are now five years uh, further on. But let me just start with a, a New Yorker cartoon that some of you might have seen. In fact, it was a New Yorker piece by their comic sketch writer, Andy Borowitz, which was produced on the June 24th, the, the day of Brexit, last summer. And he said, Britons lose long-cherished right to look down on Americans as dumber than they are. Um, well, on, on November the 8th, the, the, the playing field was leveled. Um, now, having come yesterday from London, where I'm doing some book talks, um, I think Britain's got the lead again. Um, Theresa May's... Um, pretty extraordinary allegation that the European Union is seeking to somehow interfere in the British election. Um, that there's some kind of unspecified conspiracy going on here. To do what, I don't quite know. Elect Jeremy Corbyn? Um, I think suggests that the state of our politics, um, not just in the United States, but in Britain and elsewhere, is, is, is not necessarily correcting itself. Um, which is to say that 2016 is not a blip, I don't think. Um, and I'll give you a, a sort of press seat of my book in a little while, but let me just start by talking about the Trump administration, where we are sort of 106, 100, whatever it is now, 107 days into it. Um, so clearly, the opening period of, of Trump, the first 20, 30 days, um, we were in a, a state, and Washington, the world, was in a state of panic that this really is the America first agenda. Um, that um, NATO is obsolete, the next Brexit will be encouraged, that a war will, will be built, um, and that um, a trade war with China is highly likely. And perhaps even you know, more than a trade war, given his telephone call to the president of Taiwan. Um, after November the 8th. Um, and now we're in a quite different situation where everybody's saying, ah, it's all fine. Trump says NATO's not obsolete. Trump says Europe's in good health. Um, Trump and Xi Jinping had a wonderful meeting in Mar-a-Lago where over the most beautiful chocolate cake he's ever seen. Um, and Steve Bannon has been sidelined. Um, Steve Bannon, of course, made the fatal error of appearing on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and the headline was President Bannon. This was in the first 20 days of Trump. Now, if Trump cares um, about one thing more than he does his poll numbers, it's how many times he's been on the cover of Time. He boasts this number. I've been on the cover 30 times, 40 times, whatever the number of times is. He keeps saying it in every speech. He'll mention how many times. So Bannon made the fatal error of sharing the limelight or robbing Trump of some of the limelight. Um, and he has been sidelined. And as you know, um, professionals, mostly uniform-wearing professionals, 
have taken key jobs in the administration. So Jim Mattis is, is Secretary of Defense. Um, he's a very sane, experienced um, general. Um, H.R. McMaster replaced Mike Flynn um, as the National Security Advisor. Bannon was deprived of his role of being a permanent member of the National Security Council. And of course, um, uh, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, has sort of supplanted Bannon as the horse whisperer, if you like, the Trump, the sort of key Trump whisperer of the administration. Um, and so therefore, um, therefore we are, we've gone really in the space of a vertiginous 106 days from thinking, oh, the Republic's about to end, to, oh, it's all normal. Trump's a bit eccentric, but this is going to be a conventional Republican administration. And I think both, both um, um, these sort of bipolar um, readings of the situation are wrong. Um, I think that Trump um, um, has made a deal with Xi Jinping um, to take the trade piece of this first. He's made a deal with Xi Jinping that Xi Jinping helps him on North Korea to fulfill Trump's pledge that North Korea will not have nuclear weapons. Um, I think Xi Jinping probably knows better than Trump that North Korea already does have nuclear weapons and that it's a vow Trump's going to have a great deal of difficulty fulfilling. Nevertheless, for the time being, there's been a trade-off um, that high tariff rates, countervailing duties on Chinese imports are not going to be imposed. It will not be declared a currency manipulator. We will work together on North Korea. Um, I think similarly, you've seen um, Trump um, back off from building a, a, um, a war with Mexico. He's pretending that he's building it, um, but he's not going to get the funding um, for, to build a new wall. And even if he did get the funding, the eminent domain problems along the border with this 3,000-mile border are so deeply complex and so thorny that it would be very difficult to imagine any serious kind of new wall being built within 10, 15 years. It's just too complex. So there are, there are grounds for believing that Trump has sort of come to his senses and that um, we've gone from America first to uh, a pro-globalist America in the space of 106 days. I think, though, that that's far too sanguine. Um, I think that Bannon is still in the White House. Um, uh, Trump's got a very good instinct with people. Are you a threat or are you a, a help? And Bannon... Um, as you know, was editor of Breitbart News, the me media vehicle, which is still, of course, functioning, that um, did more than any other to help Trump in his campaign and to spread the sort of alt-right message. Um, that, was Bannon's, that was Bannon's baby. It was funded, as it remains, by Robert Mercer uh, and his daughter, Rebecca Mercer, who are big hedge fund figures from New Jersey, who were also independently the largest contributors to Trump's election campaign. They are hugely important America first voices in the sort of Trump universe. Um, and I think that Trump knows if Bannon was expelled into the darkness from the White House, um, that he would go back to Breitbart and he would be enthusiastically funded to continue the job he was doing, which is to um, spot you know, fake Republicans wherever you look rhinos, Republicans in name only. Um, and Jared Kushner, it's interesting to point out, before Bannon was um, downgraded about a month ago, Breitbart was targeting Kushner every day um, as a, a traitor to the conservative Trumpian cause. It's now on ceasefire. Trump is still in the White... Uh, Bannon is still in the White House. And I think, on balance, uh, this is a guess, but I think he will stay in the White House um, because Trump understands viscerally at some kind of reptilian level that um, you need to keep your enemies close. Um, so Bannon will still be there. But m the more important point is that Trump is not actually a very competent figure. And I think that's, it, in Washington, I live in D.C., a source of great reassurance um, to people there that they imagined that this, there was this grand strategic America first plan um, that would be competently unrolled. And in fact, um, it, it, it wasn't a plan. Um, it was a sort of bunch of instincts. Bannon and others wrote these very 
very badly drafted Muslim ban um, uh, executive orders, and the system has been working. Courts have been stopping Trump. They've been staying. Uh, they understand the ban on religious discrimination part of the Constitution, and they are upholding it. So the, um, um, the, the, the sense that America First was going to be um, implemented, that's receded. The fear of that has receded. And a sense of reassurance that Trump is actually, you know, he really does. He is what he is. He is how he looks. Um, <laughs> As somebody who suffers from attention deficit disorder, um, who doesn't have the sort of temperament or the, um, the character to do these sort of really grand sort of chess games that you need to play in order to get stuff through this very complex, um, um, slow-moving political system. There is that sense of reassurance. I think against that, though, is the fear that Trump you know, remains this very impulsive character <laughs> Um, whom you, you would not trust in a crisis. And we can talk about that um, in, in the Q&A if you like. Um, the, the main point, though, I think that's worth making about Trump, um, about what we know he's going to be pursuing, is that he is, roughly speaking, doing a very good imitation of what my colleague Martin Wolf calls a Pluto populist, that he campaigned on a populist basis but he's pursuing a plutocratic economic agenda. We saw yesterday the um, House just scraped through the health care um, repeal, the Obama um, health care repeal. I think it's very doubtful the Senate is going to pass the same bill. So that's sort of anybody's guess what this comes out as in the end. But this is a bill um, that if it were passed in the same form by the Senate, would throw 24 million people off health insurance, many of them who voted for, for Trump. Um, then there is infrastructure, almost the sort of central plank of, of the economics of his campaign, not just the, the war with Mexico, but infrastructure modernization across the United States. That's been dropped. There is no plan. Um, what we have instead is a single page, 10 days ago released, Trump administration tax plan, um, which will become the centerpiece of his next, um, of the next year of the Trump administration and probably the defining issue of it. Now, I don't really want to get into, you know, too much about whether the, this particular tax plan, such as it is, it's only 239 words long, um, uh, shorter than the Gettysburg Address, which um, is what they keep saying. Um, I don't want to get into too much of a detail about whether it's fisc the economics of the American picture um, need this kind of plan. I, mean, I think it is worth pointing out that um, to the extent we can project the detail from it, about 95% of the gains would go to the top 1% of Americans, and they are not spending constraint. So the stimulative effect of this would be very, very limited because they're not constrained. This comes after you know, years of unprecedented um, income growth at the, at the upper levels. So there is that point. The, don't want to either get too much into the detail of whether it would be unfunded, um, but it's clear that having abandoned the border adjustment tax, um, which would, w was going to raise about a trillion dollars a year, um, and um, you know, having um, looked at VAT and rejected it, um, that there are no equivalent revenue raises to pay for these tax cuts. So this would be a big deficit-boosting measure, assuming Trump had the competence to, to actually marshal um, a legislative majority. This would be a big um, deficit-boosting measure. I think the important thing, though, about this is the equality effects of it, which is this doesn't pay any attention to his base, to the blue-collar um, sort of beating heart of the Trumpian um, white working class and white middle class voter. Um, and that gets me really to the question everybody keeps asking, which is, since Trump appears to be carrying out what you could describe as the a very, very large bait and switch that you campaign on one basis for the forgotten American, for the forgotten American man, the forgotten American woman, was his, one of his taglines. Um, having campaigned on that basis to then switch to really what is a fairly conventional 
um, Republican Paul Ryan Wall Street approved agenda. Um, aren't his base going to take their revenge on him? Um, isn't he going to feel the backlash um, from this um, uh, in the midterm elections and when he comes up for re-election? And the answer to that is, well, we don't know. Um, but one good guess is that the nature of politics, um, such as it is in America at the moment, um, is that what political scientists call negative partisanship is really the prime sort of motivator for people to join um, and be active in political parties. And negative partisanship means that you are in your party, you are motivated to join your party by hatred of the other party, not by a positive sort of vision of what your party will do. And you might remember there was a quite a famous observation during the campaign that the media um, take Trump literally but not seriously, whereas the Trump supporters take him seriously but not literally. Um, well, if you follow the negative partisanship sort of way of looking at how, how deeply polarized and how bitter American politics is at the moment, um, then Trump is catering to his base. He is, he is ridiculing the liberal New York Times. He's ridiculing, ridiculing CNN, the Clinton News Network. Hillary keeps obliging by popping up again and again. He's ridiculing, ridiculing Hi Hillary. He is mocking the Aspen, Tribeca, liberal elites um, to a degree that gets very, very high intensity imp approval from his base. So we, we shouldn't overlook the fact that in, 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 by that measure, Trump is catering to his base, um, even, even while he's not drawing up infrastructure plans. This is a large part of what people voted for Trump for. Um, but we also shouldn't overlook the fact, and this gets to the Pluto bit of the Pluto populist, um, that if he's able to carry out his tax plan, and if this health care bill passes, and if his budget in any shape or form, with its massive domestic spending cuts, um, gets anywhere near being um, implemented, then Trump will have very directly exacerbated the economic conditions that led to his election. He will have dramatically accentuated those trends in terms of the hollowing out of the middle, the withdrawal of investment in the middle classes that led to his election. Um, so that brings me to, the, um, to my book, which I'm not going to um, give you a full press seal, but let me just m mention one or two salient sort of features. One of the debates that um, I've been involved in the last few days and yesterday um, was asked this question when I was talking about my book in, in, in London, um, is that, well, look, 2016 was a blip. You had Brexit, it needn't have happened. David Cameron was incompetent. He shouldn't have called a re referendum. Um, and Trump, well, you know, if 77,000 votes had gone the other way in the Midwest, Hillary Clinton would be president now. So 2016 was a blip. And 2017 with Macron, most likely to be elected in France on um, Sunday, and Geert Wilders having lost the Dutch election and so on. 2017 is the cure to this blip we call 2016. And I think this is a profoundly wrong reading of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, I think that to take um, Norbert Hofer and Austrian presidential election as a good example, I think when we celebrate the breaking of the populist wave, because a postmodern neo-Nazi, or maybe that's, maybe that's libelous, a, a, a far-right nationalist Austrian, loses with 47.5% of the vote, then we have set the bar extremely low for measuring the health of liberal democracy. Um, now, let's presume Le Pen loses with 38, 39, 40% of the vote, which is roughly where the polls are right now. Um, her father lost with 18% of the vote, and that was a national emergency. Between round one and round two, Chirac um, didn't celebrate. He was solemn. He led the funeral procession from round one to round two of the French presidential election. Socialists followed him in that funeral cortege. There was a degree of solemnity that this is an abnormal, deeply threatening event. That's not the case this time. This time we have a normal candidate called Le Pen. And if Macron wins, which I think he probably will, um, bear in mind that he was Minister for the Economy in Hollande's government until two years ago. 
Um, Hollande's government, which didn't manage to get much done um, and was deeply historically unpopular, um, had a majority in the French Assembly. Macron's party, En Marche, will, I'm sure, pick up some seats in the June Assembly elections. But there is no majority there, and there is no clear program. He is winning this very skillfully in a political level by being all things to all people, by not being too precise, um, by being catch-all um, in his program. It's clever stuff. It's Obama-esque in some ways. And, and I think and hope Obama's endorsement yesterday will help him. But it's not a recipe for fixing the couche moyenne left behind problem that is fueling French populism. Um, and so I don't think Le Pen will see this as the breaking of the populist wave. I think she will think, well, five years from now, I'll have a better chance. Um, and in the United States and in Britain, where I know in Britain there's a sort of certain sense, and every time I go back, that Brexit was sui generis. Um, and Trump was just an accident, um, uh, caused by a sort of dying white majority kicking out um, uh, and assisted by Putin. Um, I think that we are also telling ourselves um, stories that are far too reassuring um, about the sort of accidental nature of these two election results. Um, they're actually very, very similar results. Each country, you know, like a Tolstoyan family, is uniquely sort of populist in its own way. Um, but the causes of this, I think, are common across the, the Western world. Um, you will all be familiar, so I'm not going to sort of trot out the statistics, but you will all be familiar with the middle class income numbers over the last generation in um, the United States in particular, but also in Britain and large parts of Western Europe. Um, that with the brief exception of a four or five year period in the mid 1990s, essentially it's been flat for household median income, but that that masks the fact that when this, um, when this trend began in the 70s, households were generally single earner households. We're now at a flat level with two earner for the most part households. So this masks the fact that the male um, uh, median wage, the blue collar male wage has gone right down. Um, I think it's no accident that um, the Brexiteers and Trump campaigned on the basis of restoring jobs from the past. Very unrealistic in economic terms to talk about coal, restoring jobs in the coal industry. Very unrealistic to talk about restoring jobs in the steel industry. There are 77,000 people still employed in steel in America, very highly productive workers, some of them with postgraduate degrees. There are 84,000 or somewhere thereabouts still down the mine, the coal mines. These jobs, these male jobs, dominated the sort of imagery of what Trump is going to restore. Um, no mention during the campaign of the 810,000 um, jobs in, as home health aides in the economy. They're mostly women, um, and they're less vocal, I guess. But if you are looking forward to the economy of the future, um, you're, going to be, you're going to be talking about making those jobs more secure, or having a new deal for the gig economy, what are the kinds of stuff you want to be hearing from politicians. Um, but Trump is um, not selling that, and the Brexiteers are not selling that. They're selling, a, in Trump's case, I think, a sort of authoritarian nostalgia um, that, as I say, um, in, t in practice is going to lead to an exacerbation of these conditions. Now, if you look at the bigger picture, people often accuse me of being too depressing and gloomy. The bigger picture is really a very positive one. Um, the world is coming out of poverty at a more rapid rate than at any time in human history. And I'm, you know, I, it, being in Ireland, I don't need to emphasize to you how quickly and effectively this can be done. Um, that um, countries can go from being poor to being relatively prosperous within a generation, and that is what is happening in large parts of the world within one or two generations. Um, that 85, 88% of humanity that isn't from the West, a large part of it um, is being lifted out of poverty, of, has um, higher and higher life expectancy rates, higher and higher literacy rates, lower and lower infant mortality and maternity de um, mortality rates, and the Millennium Development Goals were fulfilled. And the next, the next crop of goals 
um, look like, look realistic too. So in, in, in a larger sense, this age, what some economists call of the great convergence, where the rest catch up with the West, in a larger sense, this is a very positive, a very, very positive story indeed. The other piece of it, though, um, is the effect of digital technology and automation and the potential effects of artificial intelligence um, on the future of work and on the present tense of work. And I mentioned the steel workers and the coal miners. Um, more people are employed nowadays behind the wheel in America as cab drivers, Uber drivers, delivery drivers, truck drivers, than are employed in manufacturing. And they're, they're going to come pretty soon um, under threat, uh, varying degrees of threat of obsolescence. There are, since the beginning of Trump's administration, in the first three full months of employment report for 2017, um, 100,000 retail jobs have been lost in America. 100,000. That's more than employed either in steel or coal in total in just three months because of the impact, the rapid impact of technology on retail. Now, there are some new jobs being created, you know, in Amazon warehouses and in other sort of forms, but they are fewer and they're better paid. But the, the impact um, of technology and of global convergence uh, are both in their early stages. And I'd, you know, say the catch-up of India, sub-Saharan Africa, China, of course, leading it, is about a third of the way through. Technology, who knows? But we know there is a lot more to come. So that other 12% of humanity, us, the West, um, the impact on us is the, what, what I've written a book about. Um, the relentless structural downward pressure on the middle skills and the middle income. Um, on the vast bulk of our workforce is what we're experiencing politically, was what I'm talking about politically today. Um, and the question is what we can do about it. Um, because I think we, we have decades more to come of this. Um, and the answer, I think, in theory, is, is not that difficult. Um, it's a Marshall Plan for the middle class. It's massive resources, efficiently um, spent, but huge resources devoted to middle class um, lifetime training, up skills upgrading, um, to helping people cope um, with a rapidly changing um, marketplace. Denmark is a really good example. Every year, and this is an employee, employer government thing, every year everybody has the right to train in something fully paid for two weeks for, uh, on full salary to train in some skill, and most Danish employees avail of this. Um, or I'm, I'm not sure it's, if it's most, but I think it's a huge, huge number. Um, and quite uncoincidentally, the Danish have far higher job turnover than any other part of continental Europe, because people are confident to switch jobs. They've got skills, credentials, a sort of multi-skilling optimism that comes after having that kind of investment in your, in your um, in your workplace versatility, I suppose. So it's not, in theory, very hard to talk about the main sort of item on the agenda that, that any um, centre-left or centre-right sane political programme would recommend, which is a Marshall Plan um, for the middle classes. And I would add to that something I briefly referred to earlier, um, which is, in the American sense, a new deal for the gig economy. People are hopping jobs. They're not... They're no longer getting benefits from having one job that's, um, you know, contractually secure. People are, this is just the reality, moving from job to job. There is zero hours in Britain. There is contractual labor in, in America. They need a government insurance system to help them have portable benefits to build some kind of economic security um, out of their lives. And I think it is no accident. Um, you know, we have America First campaign, we have a Brexit um, campaign in Britain, both of which appeal to um, the sentiment to take back control, take back control. Now, of course, with Brexit, it was about sovereignty. Um, with Trump, it was take America back. Again, this backward-looking thing. But I think it's no accident that this resonated very, very deeply with people who feel they've lost control over their own economic lives. Um, the so-called precariat, people who, who once had a sort of se sense of security about income 
um, and about employ employment, that's gone. And there's a sort of sense of helplessness, which um, is, um, is something that I don't think is impossible to address or redress. I think that it is within our, it was within our means to imagine how you would build a program. Where I am pessimistic is imagining the politics that will carry out this program. Um, as I say, Trump, Trump came to office, um, the America in relative decline, not in absolute decline, and America in a way is actually, oddly enough, quite triumphant. The world is growing and being lifted out of poverty at a faster rate than ever in human history in a, in a Pax Americana world, in a world that where America has set the rules and is upholding the rules. So in a way, this is, a, ironically, a moment of American triumph from a sort of larger global perspective. Um, but nevertheless, an America in relative economic decline, its share of the global economy dropping as others rise. Um, with a middle class that finds it very, very hard to cope with the costs of that politically. Um, Trump could have pursued, there were hints of this kind of program in his campaign, not very well developed ones, but the infrastructure piece was certainly something he mentioned, but he's dropped that. So I think, you know, I'm not going to predict whether Bannon will be fired next week, um, you know, or, or whether Elizabeth Warren will run against Trump in 2020, but I will predict one thing, and I'm afraid it isn't a very uplifting prediction, um, that this relative economic decline that America is in and the geopolitical consequences of that, which I haven't deliberately haven't talked about foreign policy, um, will be accelerated under Trump. I don't think the republic's going to come to an end. I don't think democracy is over. Um, but I do think the deep structural conditions that meant 2016 wasn't a blip and 2017 isn't a cure are actually going to be made worse by Trump, quite, quite markedly worse. Where that ends politically, I just don't know. But I think, um, I think you know, there's a, there's a phrase I do like quoting from Bertolt Brecht, and I'll end on this because the question's always much, in, much more interesting than me talking. Um, Brecht said, um, power comes from the people, but where does it go? Um, and I think we're watching a real live, a, a real live experiment in, 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 in how that question is answered.